is going to be the time is now. Everybody said the time is now. The time is now. The time is now. And I believe that. I believe that by faith. I believe that this is the season in which the time is now for us to embrace what God wants to do in and through our lives. Amen. So Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8 says to us, this reminds me of the old days when I just, I love those days pre-pandemic when I just preached without any anything. <laughs> uh, oh, how fun that was. Amen. But you will receive power after which the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, I want to begin by layering this message. When we understand the mind of God, God is always on the move. I want you to say that with me. God is always on the move. God is always on the move. And I want you online to type that in. God is always on the move. And so the question is, are we moving with him? He is moving, but are we moving with him? And so we have to be mindful of what God is doing, what he is saying, and where he's calling us to be. And so when we talk about the book of Acts, the book of Acts, of course, the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. The book of Acts is tremendous. It is significant because it is the extension of what God first began to do in the book of Luke. Uh, our Bibles are arranged not in chronological order, I want you to understand this and get this, but in redemptive order. I'm going to say that again. Our Bibles are not arranged in chronological order, but they are arranged in redemptive order. What does that mean? It means that it is written, it is compiled in such a way that we are able to understand the story of salvation and the story of Jesus. So when we open up our Bibles in uh, the New Testament, Protestant canon, and we see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll just teach this for a second so we understand. When we see those, a lot of times we think that Matthew's gospel was written first. Uh, the way it was arranged was so that we have a greater understanding of the scripture itself and come to know who Christ is in a greater way. You following me? So historically, the actual gospel that was written first is the gospel of Mark. After the gospel of Mark, it is the gospel of Mark that shapes the tone for the gospel of Luke and shapes the tone for the gospel of Matthew. Are you with me? Amen. It is the gospel of John that is written last. Uh, that's why you will oftentimes uh, hear if you have uh, done uh, or looked into any Bible studies and studies. Uh, training in that way, and we're getting ready to relaunch our school of ministry, and I'm excited about that in the fall, but you'll find that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are oftentimes referred to as synoptic gospels, okay? And the reason why they're oftentimes referred to as synoptic gospels is because it is a similar flow. John's gospel is written close to the end of the first century. And because John's gospel is written close to the end of the first century, it has an entirely different flow and a different narrative structure. So these shape the understanding of our faith. This is important because we're living in a day today, an era in which many are using a popular term called deconstructing. And what's happening is that many are saying that there's no longer a need for faith or no longer a need for an understanding of faith, the challenge is when you deconstruct something, you must also reconstruct something. So if something is going to be pulled apart, it must be replaced with something. Well, if you don't understand the word of God as your foundation and as the anchor for your soul, uh, you'll be tossed by any and everything that you hear and say. Amen. Are you with me? You'll be tossed by uh, what you see uh, that's gone viral or any of that. And we have to measure that with what is called a biblical or a Christian worldview. 
I know somebody said, Bishop, you're very academic this morning. Yeah, but I, I'm going somewhere with this. We have to measure things with a Christian or a biblical worldview. Everybody say biblical worldview. Biblical worldview. What does that mean? That means that I have to understand whose lens I see through. I'll say it again. I have to understand whose lens I see through. So when I see something, do I see it, Matthew, through the lens of the culture I live in? Or do I see it through the lens of the word of God? And as believers, the word of God is the lens we are to see things through. Which is why when someone is murdered, innocent blood is shed, we ought to have righteous indignation because the word of God tells us thou shalt not what? Kill. Oh, you understand what I'm saying? So in a society that has gone without morals, in a society that has become increasingly chaotic, in a society that has no foundation and has no structure, the people of God must have a biblical what? Worldview. World Are you with me? Amen. We must have a biblical what? Worldview. And a biblical worldview is the lens by how I see everything. Are you with me? All right, I want you tracking with me now. So, when we look at this, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, the book of Acts continues where Luke left, leaves off in the gospel of Luke. That's why you'll see in Luke chapter 1 and Acts chapter 1 a correlation of language. Stay with me. In Acts chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1, there is a conversation that is had with a person by the name of Theophilus. Theophilus. Who is Theophilus? <clears throat> Theophilus, that name in its original connotation means a friend of God. And if you remember years ago, Israel Houghton released the song, I Am a Friend of God. Uh, it's based off of that concept and understanding that while this was a literal person, it speaks to every believer because we have relationship with God. Look at someone tell them I have relationship. I have relationship. So let's ease into this. So notice now, uh, the Bible tells us uh, that there is a conversation that's being had in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. There's a conversation that's being had. We are introduced in the beginning to the ascension of Christ. The ascension happens 40 days after the resurrection. During this time, Jesus is giving specific instructions. These instructions are to set the tone for what's to come. The instructions are going to allow us to understand and give greater insight to what God is saying. So the first thing, once you get this down, the first thing we see is instructions. Secondly, the instructions move us into insight. Now here's where I want to go with this, okay? Jesus says to them, you are going to receive power. Everybody say power. power. A lot of times you hear today people be, you know, talking about power, but, but they don't always understand what that power entails. That power is not just to empower you to have a, a, an, an experience that is ethereal in the house of God. God is not just empowering us just so that we can be exuberant in our praise and our adoration toward him in the church. God is empowering us to be a witness to the world. Amen. I'm going to say that again. God is empowering us to be a witness to the world so that when you go outside and you meet people, they will come to know the God that you worship. Are you still here? As you meet people, they will come to know who it is that you serve. Are you with me? And so notice here, the first thing we see is insight. Secondly, we see instruction. He says you are to go and pray for 10 days in the upper room. I've been there. And in the upper room, it's a very small room. It's a room that does not have much going on there. But he says you are to pray in the upper room. And what's going to happen when you pray? When you 
pray, you're praying for an encounter. You're praying for something to happen. And when I woke up this morning, the Lord reminded me of this. Because a lot of times, we today lack the end result. It's graduation season in the United States. And so, you know, we minister to people all over the world. It's graduation season in the United States. And what that simply means is, is that uh, people are, tassels are being thrown. This week, one of our own, Kiki's going to graduate. And other people, tassels are being thrown. And you know one thing about tassels being thrown? You come in and graduate, we take our pictures and we're excited and we're saying congratulations. Everybody's seeing it. Congratulations. 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 But here's the challenge with that. The challenge with that is we love the end result. Not the sleepless nights when you got to turn the papers in. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Am I making sense? Yes. We love the end result. Walking across the stage. We love the end result. Are you hearing me? We love the end result. But what? We love the end result. But we have a hard time with the process. We love the end result, but we have a hard time with the process. I'm going to preach it anyway. Amen. We love the end result, but we have a hard time with the process. And it is the process. Take this under fix it. It's the process that sometimes challenges us. When I first started, I didn't have a mic. I'm fine. It's the process that sometimes challenges us. It's the process that sometimes does not make sense. It's the process that sometimes we are trying to figure out how to make and what God is concerned about is the process. Amen. Everybody say process. Process. Everybody say process. Process. If you hear me, say amen. Amen. Now, the Bible says to us this, and it's very important that we understand this. Very important that we understand this. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on to this for a reason. I'm hanging on to this for a reason. All right? The Bible says to us that some significant things begin to happen. Some significant things begin to happen. I ain't going to stop this word. Some significant things begin to happen as we look at the scriptures. So he says to them, you're going to pray for 10 days. And when you pray for 10 days, expect me to move. Yeah. Hallelujah. See, we cannot just pray casually. Look at your neighbor and online and say, no more casual prayers. No I'm in my flow now. Thank you, Deacon Ivo. Let's look at some other stuff. No more casual prayers. No more casual prayers. Say it again. No more casual prayers. No more casual prayers. I cannot just pray casually. I cannot just pray as if I don't expect God to do it. You know, sometimes we have people today that will say, oh my goodness, I'm so sad. Well, all we can do is pray. As if prayer is the last result. No, 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 no. Prayer is not the last result. Prayer is the first offense. Amen. Oh, you better hear what I'm saying today. Prayer is not the last result. Prayer is the first offense. Amen. When I pray, I expect God to show up. Amen. When I pray, I expect God to move. Even when he answers in ways I don't want him to answer, he's still God. Even when stuff don't work out the way I expected it to, he's still God. Why? Because when I pray, I know I have a prayer answering God. If you know you got a prayer answering God in this sanctuary and all my holy amounts and praise. No more casual prayers. So go and pray. Because I'm about to move. And that's why he says to them, he says to them, he says, look, he said, you're going to receive power. I'm going to do something you've never seen before. And, and he says to them, listen, listen, you're going to receive power, verse number eight, when the spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. This thing is in my spirit. I can just flow with it. I'm going to just flow with it. All right? So notice here, he does not say, am I good? He does not say Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. He says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. It was not geographical as much as it was spiritual. Jerusalem is the foundation of where they were. It was the bedrock of civilization. It was how they understood who they were. Judea was a wider community that they were familiar with. 
What God does first is he allows them to be in their comfort zone. But then he says Samaria. When he gets to Samaria, Brother Ronald, now he's going to dislocate their common sense. Because now they're going to try to figure out how can the God that we worship now go to people that don't look like, act like, talk like, or seem like us. So now they understand or they hear that God is going to move, but he's going to move on a people that are not like what they're used to. And I'm going to say this again. It's in my spirit. I'm going to say it again. God is bigger than your box. God is bigger than your box. And we're trying to box God in based on our experiences, our circumstances, and our situation. But I'm here to tell you, God is bigger than your box. Says to them, listen, power is going to come, but this power is going to come for you to do something. It is not for you to say, oh, I have the Holy Ghost, and I can speak in tongues, and I got saved, and I got delivered, and I got set free, and nothing changes. There ought to be a change around you. And the problem is today in the church is that we like entertainment, but not empowerment. We like entertainment, but not empowerment. And that's why we're not seeing people say and change anymore because we want to be entertained by God and not empowered by the Spirit. Because when you're empowered by the Spirit, you've got to make a move. And so notice here, he says you'll receive power after which the Spirit has come upon you. Now, I, I, I want us to understand something. I want you to get this down uh, as I'm moving quickly. All right. The kingdom of God is spiritual in character. <clears throat> spiritual in character. It is international in membership, but it is gradual in expansion. I'm going to say it again. The kingdom of God is spiritual in character. International in membership, gradual in expansion. So the time is now. So the first thing, I'm going to give us three ways for us to understand this. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you something in the word that I have uh, called us to say every week. Uh, and it's going to make sense. So the first thing I want us to understand is uh, global is who we are. <laughs> global is who we are. Jesus says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So he's saying to them, you're not called to just think locally about yourself. You're called to think globally about everyone I've put in front of you and those who are not like you. So you have to be globally engaged. That's the reason why uh, uh, when God gave us this name, some of you might not know uh, this name came to me in a dream in 2000, 1999, 2000. And I saw in the dream uh, T-shirts uh, with a glow and a flame on them. Some of you may have never heard this before. Uh, I saw in the dream it was a wide open field with lots of grass. I can see it now vividly. And I saw these T-shirts with a glow and a flame on them. I thought that it was going to be a college campus ministry. I never thought it would be a church. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so what I'm saying to you is uh, when we are globally engaged, it means that we are aware of everyone around us. That it is not just about us, but it's about others. Are you with me? And so being globally engaged. So, so the first thing Jesus shows us uh, and, and us as an identity, as a ministry, global is who we are. That speaks of purpose. Everybody say purpose. purpose. So our purpose is to understand that we are not just tied to what is familiar. Now, let's go to work. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. When I get finished putting this all in the pot, it's either going to be Gumbo or Go Dead Stew, one of them. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. That's some curry gold last night. Bless my soul. Oh, my goodness. And he said, why do you haven't been treating yourself to curry goat? You know you want curry goat. I said, okay, give me some curry goat. <laughs> Amen. Acts chapter 2. You don't know what curry goat is? Ask him on the ship. Acts chapter 2. <laughs> and I want to look at something. 
When the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now, everybody say fully come. I'm, I'm, I'm reading it. I know we have these newer translations. Uh, these are scriptures I've memorized since childhood. So when I memorized them as a kid growing up, it was in the King James. So I'll be vacillating between King James and whatever else. All right. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now, uh, our, most of our new translations say when it had come, but when it had fully come. Now, the reason why that fully come is important is because it was a feast. Uh, in the scriptures in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, you know I'm a I'm, I'm Bible person. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, uh, it was a command that all uh, males, Jewish males, would go to Jerusalem three times a year. At Passover, at Pentecost, and at Tabernacles. At Passover, at Pentecost, and at Tabernacles. Those were the three feasts. So several times if you read the Gospels carefully, a lot of times we gloss over them. If you read the Gospels carefully, you will find that almost every major miracle I know happened around one of those feasts. Case in point, when you look at uh, uh, the wedding at Cana, the wedding at Cana in John chapter 2, and then you go down, at the end of that verse, you'll find that Jesus cleanses the temple. Why? Because every miracle was also tied somehow, some way, to something else in the storm. We don't read scripture just by happenstance. All of it ties to something. Okay? And so he said, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now, it's important for us to understand that they were celebrating for several days. They were all in one place on one accord. Everybody say one place. One place. And on one accord. One they were all in one place and on one accord. So, first of all, we've got to understand something. They were in one place, but they were all on one accord. So you can be in the same place, but not be in one accord. Amen. 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 <laughs> All right? Uh, uh, we, we live in the United States of America. Are we all on one accord? Absolutely not. Hello, somebody. Amen. Especially as it pertains to 2024, all of us are praying. How, how are you praying? I'm praying. Amen. Are you praying? Amen. Are you praying about next year's election? I'm praying. I'm praying. I'm praying. All right? Because it doesn't appear to me that anybody really is a front runner. Amen. Amen. From now to next year. How many of you praying? If you're not, start. Amen. 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 Start. All right, because none of the candidates, uh, from what I'm looking at, especially on the opposite end, look pretty. They don't look that great to me. Amen. Am I the only one that sees this? No. Okay. <laughs> so that means that we've got to be prayed up to understand what is happening. Are you with me? Yeah. So you can be in one place but not be on one accord. Yeah. You can be in one place and not be on one accord. I'll make this plainer for you. You can be at work in one place and not on one accord. Oh. You can be in the same car and not on one accord. You can be in the same house and not on one accord. Amen. You can be married and not on one accord. Amen. 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 It is very possible that you can be in the same place and have an entirely different experience. Yes. I didn't understand it. I used to hear people say it until now. Have a little bit. And it's amazing because you can have some of you that have multiple children or have been raised by you know a family of multiple children. They all come out differently, don't they? Yes, Amen. they do. Like Baskin Robbins ice cream. Isn't this something? Yeah. Amen. Don't you notice that? Yes. You can look there and say, that's my brother. For real? Mm -hmm. That's my cousin. For real? Yeah. And my families are fascinating. Anybody Amen. see that? Amen. Families are fascinating. You can, I was telling somebody the other day, the Bible even shows it. You can have a wise father and stupid son. Amen. 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 <laughs> Am I lying? Amen. And then you can have you can have wise sons and a dumb daddy. <laughs> Am I lying? You see it in the scripture. The Bible even showed it. David, there were times when David was a warrior, but David did some crazy stuff. And then you turn around and Solomon was considered wise. And then he turned around and fell in sin. And his son was the, his son, Rehoboam, was the son of a wise father and made a dumb decision and lost the entire kingdom. So you can have a good upbringing and still go out there and make a fool out of yourself. Am I talking to anybody? It has nothing to do with people that talk about privilege and all that. I have seen people. I have traveled all over the world with people of privilege. And I would look at them and they have some behavior that I sure enough know ain't right. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. I look at them and say, your mama raised you like that? You look at me like, why are you acting like that? I, I, I didn't have an idea that just because someone might be in a different money bracket does not mean they have the right heart. That's right. Amen. 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 Just because someone's in a money bracket that's a high money 
bracket does not mean their heart is right. And we're living in a day to day in which our society, our children are being raised up with fascinations with fame. And my prayer is that some of them will get it. And when they get it, they'll find that that stuff has nothing to do with what's in your heart, what's in your character. And you got to make sure you remember that. Because you can't buy loyalty. Tell me a story you can find. Hello, somebody. You can't buy trust. Amen. Does anybody know where trust is for sale? Amen. You can't buy loyalty. You can't buy trust. You can't, you can't buy it in a store. It's got to be something on the inside. Yeah. Glory to God. And so the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place and on one accord, and suddenly, a sound. One place, one accord, one sound. One place, one accord, one sound. One place, one accord, one sound. I want you to say, I gotta be in sync. I gotta be in sync. When they were in agreement, power came. Don't miss this. 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 When I know they were in agreement. Power came. The challenge is today we get all excited about the power. Just like we get excited about the graduation pictures. And I'm grateful. Everybody graduated. We still love Richie. All right? Uh, uh, I'm getting ready to graduate myself. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you. Okay? But here's the challenge we love the end result, but not the process. The process was in chapter one. When he told them to go pray. If they had not prayed for 10 days, it wouldn't have fell in chapter 2. We don't like to do the hard work to get the end result. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It was not just them showing up, boom, on the day of Pentecost, bam, fire fell, 3,000 got saved. Yeah, but those 3,000 got saved because 120 other people were unselfish. 120 other people locked themselves for 10 days in the same room, praying for God to move. When's the last time you were desperate enough to get outside of yourself? When's the last time you were desperate enough to get outside of your situation to ask God to do something on someone else's behalf when it doesn't benefit you? A lot of the prayers that I pray these days, and not even for myself, my family, and all that, I pray now for people and for stuff that has nothing to do with me. Sometimes I'm scrolling and I'm seeing something, and I just start praying for a person. I ask God to bless them, whether I know it or not. It don't benefit me at all, but I want God to bless somebody else. It's not all about me. That's the problem of our society today. Greed is running rampant. Why? Because we don't care about the poor. We don't care about the homeless. We don't care about the migrant. We don't care about all these things. We don't care about it until it's us. But by then it's too late. Oh my God. It's so quiet in this church today. We don't care about it until it's us. You know, you know I, I, I'm telling you. We don't care about You know, how many fires do we have to see before we get compassionate about somebody having a fire? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. I'll never forget when our church hit a fire. We had a fire issue like 10 years ago almost. And, and it was almost as if nobody even realized it happened. Amen. And what I'm saying to you is, is that we have to get to a place where we have the compassion of Jesus. Not just the power of the Spirit, but the compassion of Jesus to care about things. Because he cares for us. He cares for you. He cares for you when nobody else can. He cares for you. Amen. So we have to care for one another. Amen? Amen? That's how we break the stronghold of all this stuff happening politically and everything else. We have to begin to love one another. Amen. I'm closing. I'm closing. I'm closing. And so, second thing, those who we are, second thing, fires what we bring. So in, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we see purpose. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, we see passion. Passion. Everybody say passion. passion. The passion of the Spirit of God begins to move. They're in one accord. They're in one place. There's one sound. And suddenly, suddenly, something begins to happen. 
And they are filled with the Spirit of God as the Spirit gives them utterance. And so we got to understand that we don't need to have a half-empty tank. God wants us filled to the overflow so that we can minister and bless others. I realized a long time ago that my job is not to fill my cup all the way so that I'm always filled up, but it's to make sure that after I get filled up that I empty it out to bless others. I'm not just filled up for myself, but I'm emptying it out to be a blessing. Are you with me? And, and so when we do this, we begin to walk like Christ. See, I'm, I'm not so concerned anymore. I have been in enough services with enough, with enough four chords, enough jumping. Up. I, 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 I'm beyond. I want to get to the point where the people of God look like the God they serve. Amen. I'm not talking about somebody. I, I, I define a hypocrite as someone who likes to shout higher than they live. Mm. I'm going to say it again. Hypocrite, someone that loves to shout higher than they live. Ain't no way in the world you can clap your hands and dance and can't shake my hand and hug me. Amen. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. And we've got to get the small stuff straight so that we can walk in the fullness of the power of God. Lastly, go to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I know this is what God told me to do. I know this is what he told me to say today. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I'm almost through. <clears throat> Notice here what the Bible says. They will continue steadfastly. Everybody say steadfastly. Steadfast. Now, in the old King James Version, it'll say to the apostles' doctrine, it'll say uh, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now, the apostles' doctrine speaks of educational. It means that the people of God must constantly be learning. I want you to say this with me. Discipleship, Discipleship. is a commitment, is a commitment. To, lifelong to lifelong learning. I want everyone to say that even online. I will say Discipleship, Discipleship. Is, a is a commitment to lifelong learning. To lifelong learning. One more time. Discipleship, Discipleship. is a commitment to lifelong learning. To lifelong That's going to be a, another maxim we're going to start using in here. Discipleship is a commitment to lifelong learning, which means the more I come to know who Christ is, the more I realize there's so much more to know. The more I think I know the word, the more I realize there's so much of the word I don't know. So I don't get a full amount of, oh, I know the Bible. No, 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 no. Yeah, you might, you might know the letter of the law, but if you don't have the spirit of God in you, you'll just be somebody quoting something you don't know. And I know people like that. I have some friends that are some pure geniuses. I IQs to the roof. All right? And they have no compassion in their heart whatsoever. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. And so I want us to understand. Here's my heart today. I want us to understand that God wants us to be a people who have the power of God, not just to say we have the power of God, but to steward it in our day-to-day -day lives where we live where we work, where we play, so that others will know that there is something different about you. I'll never forget, Sister Lynch, I'm closing with this. I'll never forget, I was at an event. It was not a church event. I don't think there was anybody saved there. If there were, there was some very strange saved people if that was the case. <laughs> I was at an event. I was the only, only one like me in the event, only only black man like me in the event, everybody else was vanilla, all right? Vanilla ice cream, I was the only chocolate ice cream in the plate. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I was in there, and I was hanging out, you know, beating everybody, greeting everyone, running around. And, and the other lady looks at me, and she says, what do you do? I said, here we go. <laughs> Never fails. I can't have just a regular day. <laughs> what do you do? I said, oh, I, I love to do different things. I'm in business. I'm in you know, I'm in different things, marketing, blah, blah, blah. What do you do? I said, I do a lot of different things. It's not just one thing. No, 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 no. I help people. How do you help them? I said, well, I help them by serving them. How do you serve them? Well, I, I encourage people. To, no, no, no. You don't see, this, this is beyond just a motivational guy. You, you remind me of something. You remind me, you know, my dad is a preacher. Are you a preacher? I wasn't there for preaching. 
I was there for business. Are you a preacher? You remind me of Sonoma and all that. Other. They will see it in you. Amen. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Amen. They'll see something about you. They'll say something different. I'll never forget when my grandfather passed 10 years ago. My mother and I, we had to avoid going to one of the gas stations because when he was such a monumental figure to the gas company. The gas men were crying all, laying over, crying at the gas station. We had to avoid the gas station because he had made an impact on them. Amen. Amen. And so when you make an impact on someone, you don't have to go announcing yourself. Amen. These days, I barely ever bring cars out. I don't carry cars much at all. You know, and there's nothing wrong with carrying cars. You know, when we go out to some evangelizing street guys with cars, I said that. But I, I just believe that we ought to be authentic. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. We ought to be authentic. Yeah. I had somebody on the phone with me yesterday before I ever interrupted the call, called me. And uh, and he called me and he said, uh, he said, uh, he said, Bishop, he said, you know, I've talked to many pastors. His pastor had died during COVID. Pastor had died during COVID. He said, I've talked to many pastors. He said, but there's something authentic about you. So there's something authentic about you. God is after authenticity. Thank God I don't use notes because if I did all these papers, it's flying. This is my notes out of my Bible. Uh, uh, God is authentic about you. And he wants us to come into a greater understanding of who he is. The time is now. The time is now what? The time is now for us to move in purpose. Well, let's see we are. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. In passion, Acts chapter 2, fires will be bring. Thirdly, ministry is what we do. People. Purpose, passion, and people. On this day of Pentecost, so for us to know that when we leave this place, uh, the old saints will say, we enter to worship and we depart to serve. serve. To serve people wherever they may be. To let them know that Jesus loves them. He died for them. And he is coming again. Father, I thank you for what you have sent us to do today. I thank you that you've given us your grace, your mercy, your wisdom. I thank you that you are God and beside you there is none other. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you open our hearts to receive what you have said to us today. And we bless you for all these things. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and thank God. Listen, as we prepare ourselves, if you're not saved, if you're out of the ark of safety today, we offer Christ to you. He died for you 2,000 years ago that you might have access to the tree of life. And all he requires is that we repent and come to know him as Savior and Lord. And that he will save us, he will deliver us, and he will set us free. I know it's Memorial Day weekend, and I know we're commemorating and thinking about all those Soldiers who have died in battle and all those who have given their lives in military. And we, we honor and reverence that. But I want us to also remember this. On this weekend, there's no greater thing you can do than to give your heart over to the Lord. Yeah. And I want us to know that if we don't have, if you don't have online, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, that you give your heart to the Lord. And that you come to know him and the pardon of your sin. That is important. That is so important. Today, we see a whole lot of churches preaching for currency and not conversion. Amen. So it's important for us to understand that your life must be changed. That your heart must be changed to know him in the pardon of your sin. He said, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart the Lord Jesus, and you are saved. And if you are saved, draw closer to him. You go on our website, globalfirenow.com. We have scriptures there. We have resources there. We have tons of messages online, tons of teaching, because we believe in growing in the Word of God. We're going to receive the Lord's gifts at this time. We're going to receive the Lord's gifts at this time, the old-fashioned way. Uh, we don't have our, our screens, uh, but if you are online, we already put it in the chat on our Facebook and on YouTube. You'll see it as well uh, as we will stream it for you. Uh, we have the ways to give. You can give via Cash App, that is dollar sign Global Fire Now. Instagram, you can do that as well. Uh, dollar sign Global Fire Now. You can give also uh, via Zelle, that is Global Fire Now at gmail.com. And you can give also through our website uh, via PayPal, that is globalfirenow.com. I believe that God is going to minister to you at your point of need, and He will bring you into that which He has desired and established for your life. Now, listen. Uh, we will make sure that this word is also on our YouTube channel, and we will also spread uh, the information on our 
uh, Twitter as well, so that we are all connected in the body of Christ. I'm going to ask everyone in the house to stand. Uh, please be praying. Please be praying. We're going to get all of this resolved, but we're grateful to God for what he has done and what he continues to do. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the service today. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives, what you're Amen. continuing to do. We ask that you would bless us as we leave this place, but never your presence. Bless all of our family online. Cover us on your blood wherever we may go this weekend and even tomorrow. If we are off, let us have a restful day. If we have to work, let us get there safely. Let no truck drivers on the road, nothing crazy. Try to stop what you're doing in our lives. And we thank you. Cover our families. Pray for your families right now. You don't know where all your family members are this weekend. Cover your family. Father, we lift our families up right now. Yes, no reports tomorrow about so-and-so got in that. No. We cover them now in the name of Jesus. We stand in the gap for them now. In the name of Jesus. And we thank you for doing it in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. May his countenance be with you. And may he give you his peace. Global is who we are. Global is what we bring. Ministry is what we do. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you Tuesday night online and back in the sanctuary this coming Sunday. God bless you. Amen.